Thanks, Jeff. I appreciate that. And, and thanks to CASIS for inviting me to participate in this event. It's really great to be back in, in Canada and to be in a new-to-me part of the country, uh, this whole Kingston, Thousand Islands uh, area. It's really beautiful. And the weather, oh my gosh. Okay, is it time for the cruise yet? Let's go. <laughs> well, what are we doing in this room? Um, I, um, th this is the, the point where most of the speakers you have noticed have said, everything I'm presenting is my personal views and it doesn't represent this organization or that institute or whatever. And I will tell you that after 40 years in the US federal government, most of that in the Pentagon, I am now free at last. <laughs> and all I have is personal views now, so that's what you're gonna get. Um, I, I do wanna thank the, the organizers for choosing uh, a topic that I worked on most of my career, uh, deterrence uh, as the topic. I think it's a really timely one. There's a lot going on in the world uh, that makes us think about deterrence, including nuclear deterrence. Those are not synonymous. There's deterrence writ large, and then there's nuclear deterrence. And I'll talk a bit about each. Uh, but some of those things going on in the world. Um, on Russia, you've heard some of it already. There's there, what I see is opportunism in Ukraine and Crimea, uh, pushing on a door to see what the reaction is. Um, there's uh, nuclear saber rattling rhetoric. Um, the President Putin's March 1st speech, uh, where he showed videos of some pretty eye-opening uh, potential additions to uh, Russia's nuclear arsenal. Uh, the development, Russia's development and now deployment of a dual capable cruise missile, ground launch cruise missile, the SSC-8 which uh, is a violation of the INF Treaty. Uh, incursions, some of you know about these, incursions into NATO airspace. Uh, debates, and, and I do say debates, you'll hear some more about this tomorrow, I'm sure from Kristen Ruskard. Uh, debates about Russian doctrine and what does it really mean? Is there a potential for Russian limited use of nuclear weapons? And then of course, uh, a big one, I just spent time um, in Helsinki with some uh, congressional members of co some members of Congress, and let me tell you, interference in the U.S. electoral system is a big deal, a big deal to them, and I think should be uh, to to a, a number of us in, in democratic societies. Um, all of those things to the point that it is not surprising that we see some worried allies, uh, especially the Baltics and Poland, but but elsewhere in NATO as well, with China. Uh, there are, of course, concerns about uh, military facilities and actions in the, in the uh, East China Sea, the South China Sea as well, uh, and its development of, of advanced capabilities. Some are dual capable, nuclear and conventional. Some are, are, are um, not. Uh, their cyber capabilities, their space capabilities. Uh, the hypersonics that you, that you heard about, uh, which could be dual capable. And then, of course, there's North Korea, who's been watching TV, reading the paper lately. Um, six nuclear tests, um, dozens of missile tests over the past several years. Um, many of those while that four years that I was serving as, as Deputy Assistant Secretary. Here I will uh, note that I am personally pessimistic that Kim Jong-un will give up his nuclear weapons, but I would be delighted to be wrong on that. Um, then there's, of course, the question mark of Iran. So lots going on in the world in the, in the nuclear and broader strategic arena. So what, what do these events mean for us? I would say that even those, for those here who do not deal day to day with, with nuclear issues, if you're concerned at all about crises and conflict, um, crisis and conflict that could escalate, then you need to consider um, what Bernard Brody called the deep pedal tone uh, of nuclear weapons that underlies so much of our daily national security business. So how do we address these issues? There are lots of ways to do that. Um, I have been asked to, and I will, look at um, this administration's recent nuclear posture review. Uh, some have talked about it a bit already, but I'll give you my take on it. Um, in, in recent decades, each new president has seen fit early, early on in an administration to 
conduct, uh, direct at least, a major review of uh, U.S. nuclear policies and posture and programs. And they all do it in the context of looking at changes in the world. What's changed in the world since the last one? For example, when, uh, as, as Jeff said, I was, I was uh, executive director of the first nuclear posture review, 93-94, and I worked then for then Assistant Secretary of Defense, Ash Carter, later became Secretary of Defense, worked for him again then. Um, that first nuclear posture review was just after the fall of the Soviet Union. So obviously there hadn't been anything like this done since then, um, and so it made a lot of sense to do a soup to nuts review of everything about nuclear, about non-proliferation policy, about arms control, about command and control, about our operations and forces, and oh, by the way, starting with what does the world look like and what's our strategy for dealing with it. Um, there were, of course, reviews again in 2001 and 2010. There, some more changes, growing concerns then about nuclear proliferation and nuclear terrorism. So fast forward to this administration when um, the, the, they released their nuclear post review on February 2nd of this year. Since then, I believe there have been, let's say conservatively, Amy, Paul, Jeff, what you think about 543 conferences in Washington and elsewhere in the world, looking at is this, is this nuclear post review, does it represent continuity or change? And so there are some who say it's an assertive document, it uh, expands the role of nuclear weapons, it lowers the nuclear threshold, and it abandons arms control. And then there are others who say, no, no, it simply takes modest steps to account for changes since the 2010 NPR, and it's well within the mainstream of, of U.S. nuclear policy. So, you know, the, the nuclear posture review, I didn't bring my copy, I have several copies well thumbed, um, but the nuclear posture review looks like a document, but it's really a Rorschach test. You know, you, you read it, and I think what you see in it uh, is based on your perception uh, of, and your point of view about, about the world and, and this administration and the nuclear posture. Um, having been involved in, in three of the last four, though, uh, I'll, I'll give you my, what I see as the points of continuity and the points of change. Continuity. It does say primary purpose, not the sole purpose, but the primary purpose of U.S. nuclear weapons is to deter nuclear attack on United States and allies. It restates the traditional objectives of deter attacks on the U.S. and allies, uh, assure allies of U.S. commitments to their, de their defense, respond if deterrence fails, and hedge against an uncertain future. We were dealing with that back in 93, 94. Which way would Russia go? Would it, uh, would there be further um, a, de a deterioration and implosion in, the, in, in Russia? Would it become more authoritarian? Not, not the new Soviet Union, but more authoritarian. Or would it go as we hoped it would go to more democratic, more involved in the, in the um, community of nations? Which way would it go? So then we were hedging against uncertainty. I'd say every nuclear posture review since then has been hedging against uncertainty. There are um, other um, continuities there. Uh, it continues the programs that were begun in the Obama administration to recapitalize our nuclear delivery systems. A lot of them are really old. And you just, you know, either, either you recapitalize them or they go away. It's not a matter of just keeping them going because we've been doing that for a while. So the Obama administration said, no, we have to recapitalize the SLBMs, uh, the, the sea launch ballistic missiles, the intercontinental ballistic missiles and the bombers, uh, as well as the dual capable aircraft uh, that are deployed in Europe. Uh, that were discussed earlier. So we need to we need to recapitalize all those things. And so this one does continue those programs and the life extension for the warheads that those platforms carry. Asterisk on that one, I'll come back to that in the change. It reaffirms that the uh, US would only use nuclear weapons in extreme circumstances, another asterisk, which I think Amy Wolf has already spoken to. And it does continue to adhere to a moratorium on nuclear testing, um, and it uh, continues to adhere to the limits 
in arms control agreements with Russia, the INF Treaty and the New START Treaty. Then there's some points of change. The, the 2018 NPR does note uh, a worsening security environment, what it calls a return to great power competition and worrisome rogue states. Yes, that term is, is back again. Um, and it specifically cites Russia, China, North Korea, and Iran. It proposes to what it calls supplements to U.S. nuclear forces. One is a lower explosive yield option for submarine uh, launch ballistic missiles. I say lower because it's not, it's not low as in, it's not lower than some things we already have in the arsenal, but it is lower than the uh, options right now on, on the submarine launch ballistic missiles. And then also a study, a study to look at an AOA, an analysis of alternatives um, on bringing back uh, into being a nuclear sea launch cruise missile, the Slickums that, uh, uh, that would, could be deployed on either US ships or attack submarines. So those were the two supplements that it talked about. I've gotten a lot of attention. And then it says more about extreme circumstances when the US would consider the option of nuclear use um, on, by elaborating what it considers to be non-nuclear strategic attacks. Since Amy talked about that at length this morning, I won't, I won't go into too much detail on that one. Um, but if you look at all of this, is it more change or is it more continuity? I mean, okay, my Rorschach test says it's probably, because it was conducted by professionals, right? It was um, conducted by folks at the Defense Department, the State Department, the uh, National Security Council, the intelligence community. It was conducted by professionals. I'd say it was more evolutionary than revolutionary. Um, but these folks had to wrestle again with the security environment and explore whether and how deterrence uh, concepts and capabilities should be adapted, adjusted, made to fit, fit for purpose, whatever term you want to use, um, for a whole range of potential opponents and actions and situations and a whole wider, wide range of capabilities, uh, capabilities in the hands of adversaries and capabilities in our collective hands uh, that can contribute to deterrence. And again, that's not just nuclear. Uh, it, it does include that, but it's also conventional, it's missile defense, it's cyber, it's space, it's information. It's, any of you who have been to war colleges, it's dime, it's diplomatic, information, military, uh, and, and economic. So it's, it's all those things. Uh, and then how do you um, figure out how to tailor our concepts and our resources to suit the needs of the time? That's what every NPR and every review of its type uh, tries to figure. So this nuclear post review, again, used the term tailored deterrence. Uh, in fact, it used the, uses the term tailor in some form or another 45 times. So I'd like to explore what that means. And it's something I've been uh, thinking about and writing about since the term was introduced about a dozen years ago. And that's when I first heard it. And I will give you my bottom line up front, which is, I will show you uh, that the concept of tailored deterrence is really difficult to carry out. And then I'll say, unless you've got a better idea, I don't see an alternative. First, a few caveats. Not the one about, I'm only speaking for myself, you already know that one. Um, not the caveats like the EFP has, but caveats about, about this term. I find the term tailored deterrence to be repetitively redundant. It is, you know, the fact is all deterrence is tailored in that, of course, you have to think about uh, whom you're trying to deter, from doing what, to whom, in what context. Duh. Um, and then you have to deal with it accordingly. So in the Cold War, we tailored. We tailored mainly to one primary adversary, true. But, but even then, I think we recognize that China and North Korea, who were not new threats that just appeared this year, uh, that w we knew that they were different from Moscow. Second caveat is when I say tailored deterrence, I really mean tailoring our efforts 
to deter, tailoring our efforts to try to deter, to be repetitively redundant. I mean, really, uh, I, we may or may not be successful. And that's what I think we have to really understand. In our, we may or may not be successful. It's true of all deterrence. It is an aspiration. It is not a certainty. And then the last caveat is I'm not wedded to this term tailored deterrence. Okay? Yes, I've written things that have tailored deterrence in the title, but it was in trying to figure out what it means. Uh, you can call it tailored, you can call it adapted, you can call it adjusted, customized, call it whatever you want to. I don't really care about what word you use, but it's the, it's the under, underlying aspects of this that I want to talk about. I, I'm going to call it tailored because that's the latest use of it in the, in the NPR. So I think there are three aspects that we really have to consider. Uh, you've heard some of this, you've heard bits of this already today. One is tailoring to specific adversaries in specific context. The second one is tailoring capabilities. And the third one is tailoring messages. So we can look at the difficulty and the viability of each of those. Trying to influence adversary decision makers not to do something we don't want them to do. It, that obviously involves trying to figure out how they make decisions, right? Um, it, it, this really is the ultimate mind game. It, it really is. So example, you, you have to figure out who it is in this country that makes the decisions. How do they think and what do they care about? Who do they listen to? How are they uh, uh, influenced by domestic constituencies and, and politics? Uh, sometimes you hear about Putin or about Kim Jong-un. They're, they're really doing this for domestic reasons, right? Well, how much of that, how, how much do, does that play? Uh, what do they see as their, their key objectives? Um, that, that, that's all about how do they weigh cost and benefits? How risk tolerant are they? Um, what do they believe, really important, what do they believe about the deterrer or deterrers? Um, we will obviously never know for sure how an adversary thinks. Um, and that is the problem with the human domain. How many engineers do we have out here? Some engineers. We have, I know we have a lot of loggies. Okay, logistics guys. Um, this is not an engineering problem. This is not a math problem that you, where you can solve the equation, right? This is a human domain problem, and uh, that's we, we are learning more and more about how the brain functions, <laughs> and it's not pretty for for deterrence. Um, Many of you are probably familiar with Nobel laureate uh, Daniel Kahneman, who uh, did, did groundbreaking work in, in the late 70s with, with Amos Tversky uh, on prospect theory, an analysis of de decision making under risk. And he, he talked about the role of things like uh, heuristics and availability bias um, in, in decision making. They were not talking specifically about deterrence, but every time I read that or the newer book for the mass audience, the Thinking Fast and Slow that Kahneman wrote a few years ago, I really think it applies in spades to, to this business. Um, we, we, we really, as human beings, don't often look like that homo economicus that, that makes very logical decisions. We carefully gather information, assess it analytically, and then act according to um, the risk and gains of the situation. Um, sometimes we do that, hopefully when we're making decisions, government decisions that are about the future, hopefully we try to do that. But when it comes to crises and, and stressful situations, it's probably decisions that are fast and intuitive and emotional and gut, gut reactions. Um, so even if you are trying to figure out all those things about their culture and their history and their objectives and that sort of thing, you really are not going to know an adversary decision maker's mind and how they'll make decisions. And uh, I would say that oftentimes we can't even figure out our own decision makers. I've said that for a long time. I really say that now. Um, but, but I think that making the effort to find out as much as we can about how they think, how they see the world, how they make decisions, uh, is it, it's worth reducing our ignorance as much as possible on that. And what we aren't 
able to ascertain, then we may just have to build it into our, our uh, operational planning. That's where uncertainties come into play. Second aspect is tailoring capabilities. Um, it, it, it sort of reminds me, tailored deterrence reminds me of uh, Thomas Carlyle's formulation that language is the garment of thought. How we talk about deterrence clothes and envelops our thoughts about what to do, and that's particularly true concerning uh, nuclear capabilities, I think. And here the word tailor may be just about the right Goldilocks term. I'll call, call our set of uh, strategic military capabilities, you know, our, our nuclear forces, conventional strike, missile defenses, cyberspace, ISR, all those capabilities. I'll call all that a wardrobe. And you put it together as appropriate to the situation. You know, the classic gray shirt, the gray suit with the white shirt and a serious tie for the job interview or you change it up with a niche accessory, aqua tie in summer. Look, looking around here, no aqua ties here. Um, or, you know, the red shirt and the Christmas tie uh, for the holiday party. Uh, and so it is for, I think, our strategic capabilities. You choose among what you have for the specific adversary objective situation. Um, there's probably a, a related term in which tailoring's about right. Um, for the, the basic gray suit, you can buy it off the, the rack, right? Pret-a-porter, wear it with the pants, a little too long, sleeves a little too long. Or you can even on a government salary, that most of us have, uh, you can take it to the tailor and have it altered for a better fit. Or, or if you're visiting Hong Kong, you could even have a, a suit made from a standard pattern to fit you. But what you cannot do at a reasonable cost in, in dollars or, or time is have, you know, a couture bespoke suit made just for each occasion, uh, a style created from scratch, all the fabric woven just for you, just for one occasion. And that's true with our strategic capabilities as well. We're talking about how much money do we, can we spend to deter things that may or may not, maybe they weren't even going to happen. We don't know. We don't know. So I think um, strategic capabilities, there are ones in our wardrobe uh, that are old standbys, like our nuclear forces, uh, our general purpose conventional forces. You know, we still got tanks. We've still got those SLBMs and ICBMs and bombers. Uh, we got a few niche accessories that we can pull out. Um, and that may be some of the, the, the capabilities we're pursuing, hypersonics or, or others. Um, and you, you put them together for a particular adversary, a particular objective, a particular occasion. So in terms of, of, of capability, it's, it's not off the rack. It's not the same fit and combo for everybody. It's not bespoke haute, haute couture. Um, but it's, it's tailored as best as possible, given what you've got, what you can do in terms of both time and money. And having sat through a lot of the uh, DMAGs, the Defense Management Acquisition Group. Uh, well, that's kind of at the uh, deputy secretary, vice chairman level where, listen, every year, every year, there are big debates about what do we need? What do combatant commanders want? What's the budget? What can we afford? You are never going to have enough money to do everything you want to be able to do. So again, there's a judgment call to be had about capabilities for deterrence. Third aspect is tailoring messages. And by that, I really do mean both words and deeds. So a lot of discussion today about words, but you know, deeds, I, I have to, I have to uh, quote that famous strategist, Sting, um, and, and say that uh, you know, every move we make and every step we take, I do think that both adversaries and allies are watching. And so um, when, when we take an action in one place, others are drawing lessons from that. Maybe it's the right lesson, maybe it's the wrong lesson. But don't fool yourself. You know, just because you do it over here, don't think that uh, an adversary halfway around the world is not watching that and 
and trying to figure out what makes you tick, what makes us tick. The words too. Um, the words, I may want to be able to say something to Iran and something different to North Korea. Guess what? Everybody hears all the words. China gets our messages for Russia. Uh, Russia gets the ones for North Korea. I mean, it's just, that happens. Um, not to mention that we as democracies are not very good at message discipline. We are a cacophony of voices. It is, it is the way our systems work. In our Congress, we have 535 separate voices. I've had, I've had uh, for instance, a Chinese scholar approach me at a track one and a half and say, I have a very important question for you. I, I need to sit next to you at lunch. Okay, you're not gonna turn me. I'm, I will not be a double, okay. Um, and, the, and the very important question was, how do I know who in the US to listen to? Well, that's a really good question. And this was 10 years ago. Uh, this, is, this, is a, this is an ongoing issue. Um, and then the other way we have to tailor, I think, is we have to tailor our, our US and allied objectives as part of our message to adversaries. Um, what are we trying to accomplish? Are we trying to deter that, those, those lower level gray zone provocations? The sinking of the Chonan, the shelling of Waipido Island, all these things that happened in 2010 and uh, in South Korea. Uh, are, we, are, we, are our priorities focused on deterring nuclear or chemical or biological use? So, so how are we prioritizing those messages we send, those capabilities, what are they for? Uh, which adversaries we're trying to um, figure out and in what context? So I've talked about some reasons that tailored deterrence is difficult. What are the alternatives? Um, is there a foundational deterrence? You know, something that applies to everybody. pret a -porter. Several years ago at National Defense University, we had a senior official in the Defense Department when I was at the think tank at NDU who came to us and I think he was frustrated by the complexities and difficulties of trying to tailor to, the, to all the eaches, you know, the each actor, each situation. And he asked us if there was, isn't there something called foundational deterrence you can just kind of do and it applies across the board? And I, I have to admit that we came up empty. I think the answer is no. Another alternative uh, is um, you just make plans and acquire capabilities to deal with conflict if it occurs. And then you hope that the secondary effect of that is to convince an ad adversary not to take an action because it won't turn out well for him. So it's, it's really about defense. You don't think a whole lot about deterrence. Uh, a, a good friend and colleague uh, of mine says, all we, all we can really do, all that's in our control is to buy stuff and make threats. The rest of it is in the other guy's control. Um, so you could say, that's all we can really do. So let's not bother with all that. We can't figure out how they think. We can't tailor to eat to all the eaters, so let's just don't bother. But that's not very, uh, really a very uh, satisfactory approach in my view either. So I think the bottom line on is, is tailored deterrence a viable concept is, you know, can we do it? Can we do it completely and successfully? No. Is it worth trying to do? Yes because I don't, I don't really see a viable alternative. And now there's another question is, does the Trump NPR move us forward on tailored deterrence? And on that one, let me know. Um, I, I, I really am interested in hearing your thoughts and comments on what we need to do as we look not just to this year and the next year and the next year in NATO and in each of our countries. You know, the next, not, not just this administration, the next administration and the next one. What do we need to do? What do we need to be thinking about? How do we need to build our wardrobe for what we have now and what we see coming in the future? And um, that's why I think this conference is, is really important. Uh, there are just a whole lot of judgment calls. The judgment calls about whether your action deters or spurs your adversary. There are judgment calls about what makes extended deterrence credible. There are judgment calls about how much is enough. 
And we will just keep revisiting those questions over and over and over as individual countries and as an alliance. So I really do want to hear from those of you who are not has-beens, but, but you are the R's and the will-be's. So uh, please, let me know what you're thinking. Thanks very much.